Welcome back to another episode of the Hermit Poetry Series. I'm Neil Aiken, and on this channel I read poetry, mostly work by contemporary poets, occasionally poems of my own, and once in a while poems from the past. Today's poem comes to us from, well, from me, from my second book of poetry, um, Babbage's Dream, published by Sundress Publications in 2017. Uh, the poem I'm going to read is midway through the collection and is entitled Babbage Descending into Mount Vesuvius, 1828. Um, Babbage here, from the title and from this, this particular poem, refers to Charles Babbage, the 19th century mathematician who uh, designed and partially built but never finished what would have been the first computer. He did so uh, having conceived of the idea as early as the 1820s and starting work on it in the 1830s, um, far ahead of his time. Uh, a man with a vision without a society that had any clue as to how to fit that vision um, into it. They didn't understand, they couldn't imagine the context for what he was trying to work on. Um, and there existed no language really to describe what he was doing. Uh, this idea of having a, a vision, a dream bigger than a lifetime is always, uh, well, it, it, it's been something that I've been attracted to, that I've been fascinated by about, about Babbage's life and about others like Babbage. But behind that story is yet another story. And that's the, the tragedies that attended Babbage throughout his life. Um, we might know him for his technological innovation and advances, but behind that, there was also a man who lost almost everyone he loved. Um, Charles Babbage in 1827 um, experienced a devastating year in which uh, a fever epidemic rolled through England. And as a result, he ended up lo losing um, his beloved wife, Georgiana, um, who was really the only person he ever truly romantically was involved with at any point. Um, all accounts say from his mother, uh, Babbage's mother even acknowledges the fact that after Georgiana's death, Babbage was forever changed. That spark, that light that had carried him through all those years, um, and especially in his early innovations, uh, was diminished. And instead, you know, he pressed on, um, still with a fire for what he was trying to do but he was never really the same person. Um, so he lost his wife. He also lost his father and he lost, uh, at least one of his children during that year. Um, so it was devastating. Uh, in 1828, um, as was common, uh, for many, for many people of the, the 19th century, part of his process for dealing with grief and sorrow and stress was he traveled and he went to England. Uh, he went to, he went to Italy. He went traveling throughout the European continent. He ended up in Italy in a hotel room, staring out of his window, um, at Mount Vesuvius, a dormant volcano. And he hatched a plan. He came up with an idea which when we look at now seems ridiculous, seems um, unnecessarily dangerous. Um, but he was obsessed with learning more about the natural world. At least this is how he presents it in his biography. In his, his own memoir, he talks about the fact that he went forward intrigued by the natural world, wanting to understand the internal workings of volcanoes, and so arranged to be lowered down into the heart of the dormant Mount Vesuvius, and while down there, conduct a survey. Um, and the first time I read this account in his memoir, he presents it in a somewhat comical fashion, um, as something of a sort of a scientific lark to go and do this crazy thing. But when I looked at the dates, I realized this was the year following all this different death, all these different deaths that had come upon him and the tragedies that attended those losses. And I thought, yeah, this action that he proceeds to, to follow, the things that he does while he's down there inside of the volcano, these are not the actions of someone who is well, but someone who is hovering, teetering on the edge not knowing where to go next. So this is Babbage descending into Mount Vesuvius, 1828. All day your company has carried you on the backs of horses and men humoring your strange obsession with flame and ash. 
Now, long before dawn, you stand heavy at the crater's edge, rope in hand, walking stick and measuring gear at your side. Below you, a plane of fire and darkness spidering out like the blood vessels of an eye revealed by artificial light. No one is eager to fall you down. The raw earth exhales sigh after poisonous sigh. Your feet are lost in the gray remains of unmade stone as you ride deeper into the cindery maw, as you descend onto the troubled skin of what might be hell. Here, the world is always being destroyed beneath your feet. Your walking stick turns into a pillar of flame, a poor guide home. Everywhere, the hot breath of death and decline. Everywhere, between the time bursts of molten light and heat, the song that tears through all the layers of earth, through all, through so many moving parts, how it beats like sorrow in a locked room, like the name of a love buried beneath a mountain of iron and clay. It's a dark place here, within your heart, at the end of the world, emptying itself of meaning, translating loss into fire and ash. What is grief to a man surveying a landscape that will never be here again? What is the void that burns the sky with yellowish light? Here, in such radiant absence, you turn your eyes away. Imagine again her hand, her face, her skin. So when Babbage was down there in the bottom, in the, in the dormant part of the crater, he noticed that there was a portion of the crater in which there was still an active um, eruption. These are micro eruptions, small eruptions um, in the heart of the volcano. And he walked over there and he saw that there was a rocky ledge that, 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 leer, that leaned out over the edge you could peer down into the heart of the volcano from. And so he timed the eruptions. And then he lay himself down on the ledge. And he peered into the heart of the volcano. And then before the next burst, he stood up and walked away. And I have forever thought about that, that that is the action of someone who peers into the abyss and then realizes there's something left to do, and he comes back. Um, so, uh, whoever you are, wherever you are, if you've ever had days like that, moments like that, I want you to know it is worth standing up and coming back. Um, I'm grateful for the power of poetry and the power of art to inspire us to keep on keeping on. I know this is a hard weekend for many people. Um, it brings back a lot of a lot of difficult feelings and a lot of, a lot of loss and a lot of sorrow, but there's also courage and there's also hope and there's also beauty. And there's also the fact that we're here, we're here now and we can keep doing things. We can keep creating things and we can keep persisting. I'm thankful that we have the power to do these things. And I'm grateful that we have friends that we can reach out to. I'm grateful for all of you. And I hope in this small, small way, we can remember, we can find joy, um, even as we navigate the difficulties of sorrow. I'm thankful for voices out there um, who are crafting beauty and hope and inspiring us. And I'm also grateful for the courage to write about difficulty, for those who have the gift to write about sadness and grief and anger and are able to find a path out of that as well. And it doesn't mean that the poems or the literature or the art has to do it in one sitting. This is a long journey, but I'm grateful that we are not without friends and not without signposts along the way, that the landscape is not a barren, empty place like the bottom of a volcano, but instead is a verdant place, a place full of transformation and hope. And so I hope for all of you and for me, that we'll continue to find joy and delight in literature and art, and that we'll continue to persist. Um, I'm thankful for all of you. I wish you all the very best. If you like what I'm doing, um, please do check out the description of the video for more information about 
the this project and other projects I'm working on. Um, please do consider liking these videos, uh, hitting the thumbs up button, um, or subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell icon um, and support me in that way. Um, not that it ever translates into anything monetary, but it's just good to know that there are other people out there um, who are experiencing these things, thinking about these things, enjoying good literature and art. And uh, if you have suggestions or recommendations, please feel free to comment below with those. Um, I'm always open to suggestions. I'm always open to hearing from you. And I look forward to hearing from you all. Um, and wish you all the very best. So until next time, uh, stay safe and well. Stay active. Keep creating. Keep writing. Keep doing things. And uh, keep persisting. And we will, uh, we will meet again. And we will talk again soon. Uh, I'll be back with another episode in a couple days. And uh, more poetry and more reading. Until then, um, wishing you all the very best, and we'll, we'll see you soon. Goodbye.